Hello everyone. In the last lecture, we discussed the alpha decay and we observed that alpha decay is seen in the heavy nuclei, particularly the masses more than 200. But of course, up to 150 to 200 also alpha decay had been seen with very, very long half-lives. And then uh, we also discussed that the the half-lives for alpha decay would be explained by considering the barrier penetration formula. And also we discussed the systematics of alpha decay among the isotopes and the isobars of a particular element or the isobaric chain. Today we will discuss the beta decay. As all of you know that beta decay happens along a isobaric chain because the mass number does not change in the beta decay. Beta decay could be beta minus decay, wherein the atomic number increases by 1, or it could be beta plus decay, wherein the atomic number decreases by 1. So, I have just given the schematic for beta decay. In beta minus decay, the atomic number increases by 1, and along with that, a beta minus, which is an electron and an anti neutron, is emitted. For example, sodium 24 emits a beta minus to give you sodium magnesium 24. In beta plus decay, the atomic number decreases by 1, emitting a positron and a neutrino. And this reaction has got a threshold of 1.02 MeV. So, why this condition has come? Why is there a threshold for beta plus decay and why there is no threshold for beta minus decay? So, as you can see here, that when the atomic number increases from Z to Z plus 1 by beta minus decay, there is one extra, so there will be an extra electron in the, so for example, you take sodium going to magnesium. Now, this sodium, so when it comes to magnesium, it is actually one electron more, but the, there is no electron gain, so it will pick up electron. It should be, it will become actually positively charged. When sodium converts to magnesium, it will be positively charged. It can easily pick up an electron from the surrounding. So one electron is limited by sodium 24 and magnesium picks up an electron. So the in terms of electron, there is no loss or gain. But in case of beta plus decay, when the atomic number decreases by 1, for example, phosphorus goes to silicon, phosphorus 30 goes to silicon 30. So, from 15 it becomes 14. Then, when a elect electron, you see here it is a, it is what is happening, a positron is coming out and there is a, so this atomic number has decreased. So, there is one extra electron, there is one electron is actually gone. So, uh, so it is electron, one electron less than the parent isotope. Because of that, the atom loses an electron from the atomic cells. So, instead of, so because of that, there is a pair, a positron is going out and electron from the atomic cells is going out. So, the, because of this condition, the mass difference between the parent and daughter has to be more than the rest mass of a pair of electron positron that is 1.02 MeV. I hope it is clear. In beta plus decay, since the atomic number has decreased, the electron, the, the positron is anyway emitted, but the electron which is excess now in silicon 30, that electron also will be emitted and so the mass difference between the parent and daughter has to be more than or equal to the rest mass of a pair of electron positron that is 1.02 MeV. So, whenever the Q beta value is more than 1.02, then only the beta plus decay is possible. Otherwise, beta plus decay not possible. And in such situation, when Q beta is less than 1.02 MeV, 
electron capture is the mode of decay. So electron capture competes with beta plus decay when q beta is less than 1.02 mv. Just to give an example, beryllium 7, so it is electron capture. What does it mean? The nucleus captures the electron on the atomic orbitals. So it could be k electron or l electron depending upon the q value for the reaction. So electron is captured by the nucleus and you have here lithium 7 plus neutrino. So this is in this process there are no particles emitted but the, when the electron is captured by the beryllium lithium 7 will have a hole in the k shell and there will be emission of gamma x-rays X from the atoms. So electron capture is always accompanied by emission of x-rays and also the OZ electrons. So <clears throat> this uh, Particles that are emitted in the beta decay, it could be electron or positron and also the neutrino and antineutrinos. Let us first discuss the energetics of the beta decay. As we have seen previously, that beta decay occurs along the isobaric chain, say particular A, for example, it is odd A, then the, the lower Z like, like this and tin, antimony, tellurium, they are undergoing beta minus decay and the higher Zs are undergoing beta plus decay to stabilize at uh, the most stable isobar. And as you can see here, the Q beta values are decreasing from both sides. So as the, the whatever nucleus is away from the stability has got a higher Q value. One of the important observations of beta decay was that beta decay is, beta spectrum is continuous. Just I have given an example here, the phosphorus 32 has a spin of 1 plus undergoing beta minus emission to sulfur 32 which has a spin of 0 plus. So this gamma decay, the, the beta decay taking place between two discrete states, ground state of phosphorus 32 do that of the sulfur 32. But then if you see the beta spectrum, the beta spectrum, what is this? Like energy of electron versus the number of electron or dn by dE. The beta spectrum is continuous. The blue one is beta minus and the, 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 the red one is the beta plus. So beta minus or beta plus have a continuous spectrum. So this cannot be explained simply if you consider the decay of a state of 1 plus 2, another state, both of them are discrete. So apparently there looks to be a violation of conservation of mass and energy. How to explain this mass, uh, the continuous spectrum beta plus, beta spectrum we will see shortly. Another violation that appears to be here is the angular momentum conservation. You see here, phosphorus 32 is 1 plus, sulfur 32 is 0. If only electron was emitted or electron, then electron spin is half. So 1 plus minus half can be half or 3 by 2, but the dot product spin is 0. So again, the initial spin and final spin are not, not matching and apparently there is a violation of the conservation of angular momentum. So this, this puzzle was actually solved by Wolfgang Pauli in 1930 when he proposed the neutrino hypothesis. You see, it, it was a hypothesis. Wolf, Wolfgang Pauli proposed that there has to be one more particle emitted along with the beta particle in beta D. And that particle he named as neutrino. So he, this is a, the, that another particle is accompanied with a beta particle. So two particles emitted along with the the residue nucleus that is formed. And this, the properties that uh, Pauli predicted, it has to have a spin of half, no charge and no mass. So once you include one more particle neutrino having a spin half, no charge and new mass, then you can explain the conservation of mass and energy as well as that of the environment. So you can see here, when you have the another particle, so there is no Three, there are three particles now. So a neutron is getting converted into a positron, 
plus electron for proton electron minus plus a neutrino so the q beta of this reaction is shared among the three particles and when the q is shared among three particles uh, there can be infinite solutions therefore the the, the number that the energy of electron and neutrino can be very condensed so in this particular one when the energy of electron is very high then energy of neutrino will be low when energy of electron is very low energy of neutrino will be high so that is how you can explain the continuous spectrum of beta similarly the angular momentum also can be explained now so you have the phosphorus 32 1 plus charge state an electron it goes out and a neutrino also is emitted both having spin half to spin half so the angular momenta can couple in a way l plus minus half l plus minus half and so it there is a combination of l and s1 s2 here s1 s2 electron and neutrino can give you zero spin for example if you have one minus half minus one half can be zero so it is now possible to explain the conservation of angular momentum by spin half neutrino and it is also possible to explain the continuous nature of the beta spectrum so this in fact this uh, neutrino was discovered in 1956 you can see here and uh, the reaction was that uh, in the reactors there, there are a lot of uh, neutrino and there is a fission there is a neutrino emitted so beta beta decay there is, there is a hydrogen so the neutrinos interact with the hydrogen to give you a neutron and a positron and a triple coincidence so you detect the neutrino in a, in a detector neutron detect neutron in neutron detector and the positron will annihilate give you 2511 kv gamma ray so the triple coincidence between one neutron and two thyroid kv gamma ray is a unambiguous proof of the existence of neutrino. So that is how the, the, the neutrino was discovered after almost 25 years of its prediction by Pauli. So we can explain the energetics. Now let us see how to explain the decay constant. So that the theory of the beta decay was in fact given by Enrico Fermi in 1934. And the first question it comes to mind is whether this electron that is emitted, it comes from nucleus and how, how it comes. So that is the question. And we will see later on that actually it is not present in the nucleus. Electron is not present in the nucleus, but it is generated whenever there is a weak interaction. We will see that. So the, let us see how why it is not present in the nucleus because wavelength of the electron, if you have one MeV electron coming out in beta decay, and what is the wavelength? Lambda is given by h upon p moment, momentum, the de Broglie wavelength, or p can be written as root 2 Me with mass and energy. And if you substitute the value of the Planck's constant in joule second, and then the mass of the electron, and then the conversion factor for joule to MeV, it comes to 10 to the power minus 13 meters. So the wavelength of the, the electron the have, having energy of about beta, beta particles uh, is much larger than the dimensions of the nucleus. Therefore, it, the, the hypothesis that if electron is present in nucleus is not possible. So uh, essentially, the beta particle is created during the conversion of a neutron to a proton or a beta plus is emitted is created in a bound proton because the proton mass is less than that of neutron so proton cannot decay into neutron the free proton but a bound proton in the nucleus can be converted into a neutron by emission of a beta plus so this is the, these are the expressions give you how the conversion between neutron proton happening in, in the beta decay. So these particles, electron and positron, are created when the one nucleon is converted into another in this process. Now to calculate the decay constant, we will go a little bit into the more details, though I will not have to go to the complete theory, complete derivations of the expression for the decay constant, but I give you a flavor uh, by considering what are the major factors that Fermi took in the determining the lambda for the decay, the beta decay. 
So, <clears throat> Fermi golden rule for any transition is given by this kind of an expression. Here it is only for, is for the beta decay. That is the probability that an electron is emitted with momentum between Pe and Pe plus dPe. That means Pe to a small increment in a Pe plus delta E, delta Pe. What is the probability that electron is emitted? And corresponding to that probability, there is a electron and neutrino also emitted. So when there is a dPe, there will be dp nu also. So np dpe, np dpe is given by Fermi golden rule 4 pi square by h. The probability of finding electron at the nucleus psi e psi nu. Probability of finding the neutrino at the nucleus. This is the matrix element between initial and final state for beta decay. G is the G factor which Fermi introduced to characterize the weak interaction between the three particles, nucleus, electron and the neutrino. And in fact, this G is analogous to electronic charge in electromagnetic interaction. So it is essentially a particle of weak interaction. And then this is the density, the statistical factor, which is density of states. So when, a, say for example, a particular isotope is decaying by beta, so it will be populating some states. So what are the density of states in the nucleus? Suppose it emits gamma ray. So there is the density of states dn by dE. So when the electron is emitted and along with that neutrino is also emitted, then the density of states in the residual nucleus will be given by dn by dE0. And E0, the total energy of kinetic energy of total kinetic energy is equal to energy of electron plus energy of the neutrino. So E0 is shared in an infinite number of ways between electron and neutrino. <clears throat> so let us see how we can uh, derive the final expression for the decay constant. So a little bit more details, the dn, the density factor is nothing but the dn e into dn nu, density for the uh, electron and neutrino and it is you can see the phase space and the momentum space for the electron and neutrino or pi p square dp by h cube. These are the momentum space for electron and neutrino. So it can be it is calculated to be 16 pi square by h cube into e nu square by c square. So you can say p equal to e by c for neutrino and d e 0 by c and so d e 0 because e nu is e 0 minus e e. So since e, e, e is constant you can say d e nu is d e 0. So you actually try to eliminate the term corresponding to the momentum and energy of neutrino because what we are observing is the electron. So p nu can be eliminated using p nu equal to e nu by c and so that is equal to e 0 minus e e by c and d p accordingly then d p nu will be d e 0 by c. From here d p nu will be d e 0 by c. So you so final expression will be dn by d0 will be the term momentum space term then p e square e0 minus e square into dp. So we have now the terms in energy and momentum of electron. And now we can make a small substitution that is called the in the relativistic domain, you can write the relative momentum in terms of the momentum of electron and m0c relativistic momentum of electron. So Pe upon M0C, similarly the energy can be written as energy, kinetic energy of electron upon the S mass energy. So it is the relativistic energy W. So these two terms, eta and W we introduce in, to get this simplified version. Dn by DE0, which is the, the term corresponding to this 16 pi square M0 5 C4 upon H6 into W square minus 1, W0 minus W square into WDW, where W is nothing but the relative energy and eta is the relative momentum. And you can also find out that W square is nothing but 1 plus eta square or eta square is W square minus 1. So finally, you can see this expression, actually the density term is just explains the shape of the beta spectrum when W becomes 1. That means eta equal to 0. So that corresponds to the zero momentum of electron. When W becomes a W0, 
then this term becomes zero. So at both ends, first end zero energy term end W equal to one, and the higher highest energy term W zero equal to W. So the the bell shaped spectrum of beta can be explained by this fermiability theory. But the observation is that you see the bell shape is observed for beta plus, but for beta minus the there is a at low energy there is a rise. So more electrons of high low energy are observed than beta plus. So this difference is there. So this is explained by a Coulomb correction factor. That means when the electron or positron is coming out of the nucleus, electron is attracted by the nucleus, whereas positron is repelled by the nucleus. In simple terms to explain. So there are more high energy positrons than electrons. There are less, there are more low energy electrons than positrons. That's why the electron spectrum has a lower energy component more than the positron. So this Coulomb correction factor was given by Fermi. It depends upon the atomic number of the nucleus and the energy and the energy, W is the relative energy. And it is given by 2 pi y upon 1 minus e raised to minus 2 pi y, where y is z e square by h v, where z is the atomic number of the residual nucleus and v is the velocity of beta particle at infinity. And this term y is actually positive for electrons and negative for positrons. And if you substitute this value, this plus minus uh, y, plus minus z e square by h v in this in the, the factor here, then we can explain the shape of the beta nice spectrum. Very minus spectrum is more having high low energy component, beta plus spectrum has got high, high energy component. So that is how the Coulomb correction term can explain the shape of the beta minus and beta plus. The Fermi theory in fact got a boost when it was successfully validated by Curie plot. So Curie in fact came out with an excellent idea of plotting what is called as the this factor. Let us see what is this factor. So the, in the again when I am saying momenta it is the momentum, relative momentum eta. So n eta d eta proportional to f z Coulomb correction factor eta square w0 minus w. You can write it from the previous expressions and then you can rearrange this equation that n eta upon the f, f factor to the power half equal to a constant into w0 minus w. So actually it has to be it has to be square term here. So this this term now if you plot this left hand side against w then you get this term. so i w is nothing but n eta you can write in terms of w or eta w is related w square equal to 1 plus eta square upon the Coulomb factor eta square to the power half is was found to follow a straight line with a negative slope because of this negative term and very nicely these plots, Curie plots in fact were used to identify if there are, if there is a mono energy, if there is a single beta or there are multiple beta particles. So like if there are more than one beta group then you have these two linear paths there are two more than two you have three linear paths and so on so the curie plot was very handy when the mass spectrometers were utilized to determine the electron spectrum in momentum space mass spectra will resolve them as per their momentum and when you plot the data the, this particular expression i w upon f z w then you find that the each beta group follows a straight line with the slope that you can find from this equation so this was the success of uh, Curie plot that validated the Fermi theory of beta decay. Now let us see how to compare the half-lives for beta decay. So again the same expression, I am writing again in more details, NW DW is the, uh, the term which is came from the momentum space, the G factor, the, the, the transition matrix is square, Coulomb correction factor and the W factor, energy factors. Now the decay constant essentially is the, we, as we discussed previously, the decay constant lambda is nothing but the probability of decay per unit time, probability of decay of an atom per unit time. 
So if you integrate this equation over from W equal to 1, that means energy from 0 to highest energy, then you integrate this NW dW, this expression. So you get, you can be final expression I am giving K, a constant term, MFIF square, the transition matrix square, FZ comma W0. And this you can lambda you can mention as 0.693 or ln2 upon t half. So t half into f is called ft. In fact, it is very popularly called as ft. Then that is ft is proportional to constant upon mf square, where m is the matrix element four times. So you can see here ft is inversely proportional to mif square. Smaller the value of log ft, greater the value of F square. Essentially, it means that if a transition is allowed, it will have higher value of uh, MIF. So, lower value of log FT is an indication of a alloweredness of this. So, for allowed transitions, log FT is varying from 3 and it goes on to higher values. We will see it very soon. So, the selection rules for beta decay are in fact there were two selection rules, one by Fermi because depending upon the spins of electron and neutrino, whether they are perpendicular to each other or parallel to each other, whether they are parallel or anti-parallel. So if electron and in the in the Fermi selection rule, electron and neutrino are emitted anti-parallel to each other, so the spin the spin component is zero. Whereas in the gamma teller selection rule, electron and neutrino are emitted with parallel spin, so the spin factor is one. So Fermi selection rule says I i equal to I f plus L. L is the angular momentum carried away by the electron. And so S becomes because S is 0. But gamma teller selection rule says that I i equal to I f plus L plus 1. 1 is due to the spins of electron and neutrino which add up to 1. For allowed transitions, we say L equal to 0 and there is no change in the parity because this is the S wave alpha particle. So we can say L plus S equal to L I I minus I F to I I plus I F where I I and I F are the spins of the parent and daughter isotopes. Delta pi, the change in parity is given by minus 1 to the power L. These are the selection rules. The super allowed transitions occur between the pairs of mirror nuclei. You can see from neutron to proton or tritium to helium 3 or fluorine 17 to fluorine 18, 17 to oxygen 17. You can see here that the orbitals of proton and neutron in the two nuclei are exactly same. As a result of that, the delta i is 0, delta l is, l is 0 and delta pi is 0. That means there is no change in parity and the log of t values are of the order of 3. Whereas in the case of allowed transitions, the delta i, delta i is 0, but the, the proton and neutron need not necessarily occupy the same orbit. Therefore, delta i is 0, L equal to 0 and no change in parity, but the log of t values are higher than 3 in the range of 4 to 7. First forbidden, now you can see delta i 0, 1, 2, L value 1, 1, 1, and there is a change in parity. So, log of t values are higher. And Second forbidden again delta i is 2, l is 2, no change in parity, 10 to 13 log ft, third forbidden and so on. So as you go to higher and higher forbiddenness, there is a rise in the L value. Just to give an example of uh, this decay, sodium 24 having spin state 4 plus decays to magnesium 24 and you see the ground to ground transition is forbidden because it is delta i equal to 4. Whereas the 100% transition goes to 4 plus state, so 4 plus to 4 plus is allowed transition, delta i is 0, delta pi is no, no change in parity. 4 to 2, see this is second forbidden transition, delta i is 2 and delta pi is no change in parity, whereas there is no, no ground to ground transition. So that is how we can explain type of transition. And lastly, just to before I conclude. Just I was telling about the how electron and neutrino are coming out. So from the quark structure of nucleons, a, quark, a neutron is UDD, one up quark and two D quark. A proton is UUD, two up quark and one D quark. And so conversion of a D quark into U quark happens during beta minus decay. So this is actually nicely explained by this Feynman diagram 
a neutron is converted into a proton in the process a w boson is emitted and then this w boson decays to a electron and a anti neutron so that is how in fact the advanced theory of beta decay in terms of the weak interaction whereby the neutron when the neutron is converted into positive proton then a w boson is emitted and in the process w boson breaks into electron and a neutrino and the forward backward asymmetry of beta particles in fact was observed that explain that in the beta decay or in the weak interactions parity is not concerned so these bosons w bosons and z bosons in fact they are the actually the particles that are mediating the weak interactions in beta decay and you can see the masses of these particles they are very high of the order of gev so this is in fact the ultimately all these interactions you know beta decay weak interactions are explained in terms of the weak interaction wherein the w bosons or the z bosons are involved in the process so i will stop here and next i will take the gamma decay thank you very much